When we think about aging, it's rare to find uplifting examples of good health. Usually we see our families and relatives dealing with aching bodies, pain, and a decline in physical capacities. But if we look hard enough, then the answers to maintaining physical youth are right in front of us. All we need to do is deconstruct the capacities that keep the body young, regress them to our current level, and make consistent progress over time until we unlock those abilities. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you a training concept that will change the way you approach your physical practice for the rest of your life. And I'm also gonna give you five keystone capacities that if improved, will allow you to become an outlier that moves and functions differently than everyone else in their age group. A keystone capacity is a modality that if improved upon, will have a domino effect in improving many other aspects of your physical health. I've selected these capacities primarily for the benefits they'll bring your body as you age. Along with that, they'll improve multiple aspects of your movement movement ability, helping you become a better overall athlete. I've chosen these capacities for two specific reasons. If microdosed, a concept that I'll explain to you in a second, they're minimally invasive to your lifestyle. They don't need to be done at a gym, which some people can't get to every day. You can do these things at home, at work, or at a park. We do this uh, methodology called microdosing. So essentially we're in season training and we lift six times a week. It's in small little increments. And essentially we just take one major movement and ride the hell out of it that day. It's more of like a glorified strength warm up. This method is how I've been able to build so many different capacities into my physical practice. By doing a little bit each day, literally as small as one to three minutes on some days, I chip away at the skill, slowly improving until I'm at a point where I'm proficient. Then I keep it for life. Seriously, one to three minutes a day is all you need. If you wanna do more, you can. But the goal of the microdose is making the capacity easy to practice. Be comfortable with slower progress. You'll be surprised at how good you are at any capacity within the next six months. Now, the next part is essential because when most people try picking up new habits and capacities, they don't stick. So in this next minute, I'm gonna explain the four rules of habit change from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Number one, make it obvious, meaning keep these tools in a place or area that is easy to reach. This increases the likelihood that you'll actually do the thing. Number two, make it attractive. We need to like what we're doing, and sometimes that means that the equipment we use, whether it's a journal, an instrument, or a piece of training equipment, is something that we will enjoy picking up. Rule three, make it easy. In essence, this is the microdose concept. Don't bite off more than you can chew. With all these keystone capacities, aim for just one minute a day and stay consistent. Many days you'll do more than one minute, but if you do at least one, you're golden. Number four, make it satisfying. The capacities I'll be sharing with you are movement-based, so you'll probably feel really good after completing any of them. That feedback loop of endorphins and feel-good hormones will keep you coming back for more. Keystone capacity one, jump rope. When is the last time you jumped or skipped? The reason why this is at the top of my list is because it's an ability that we all used to do as kids, unless you had no legs. <laughs> But I do have a lot of friends that recently had kids and they complain that their kids jump on everything. Then we stop jumping. At some point in life, we jump without realizing that that is the last jump that we'll ever take. That's where the jump rope comes in. It's frustrating at the start. The rope is gonna whip the fuck out of you. You'll look uncoordinated because you are uncoordinated. This is why we microdose the habit. Instead of making the jump rope a gargantuan task, telling ourselves we'll do it for 15 to 30 minutes a day, we're gonna instead aim for one to three minutes a day. Some days you might do more, but doing a small dose, let's say two minutes, of jump roping a day for one month is one full hour of jumping. That's one full hour of the activity that you weren't doing at all before. We're looking at the long game here, and as your skill improves, you're gonna wanna do it more. The rope I use is from Cross Rope, my personal favorite being the quarter pound rope, but I also sometimes use my heavier one pound, four pound, and five pound ropes. Cross Rope has the absolute best weighted ropes in the game, and they also have ropeless ropes, which are pretty awesome if you're in a confined space, hotel room, or wanna get some quick work in the office. This keystone capacity allows you to hold on to your plyometric ability, which most people lose as they age, because if you don't use it, you will absolutely lose it. The jump rope will also increase the strength of your feet as they hit the pavement with each hop, improving your bone density over time. As you get better with jump roping, you'll improve at keeping your body relaxed as you jump, enhancing your ability to let go of excess bodily tension. Rhythm and balance will improve, especially as you slowly begin to add in single leg hops. All of these are extremely important capacities to maintain as we get older. Keystone capacity two, rope flow. When I first watched someone do rope flow, I thought it was a gimmick. 
But over time, as I worked on it and improved, I quickly realized the multiple benefits it was bringing my body. What it's doing is it's integrating everything. Rope Flow is unified beat that is sting. It ain't a bumblebee, it's a wasp that keeps on stinging. Anyone can do it, and the integration that you get is second to none. And the level of coordination, that's the coordination of a person who could juggle 10 balls. But it's attenuated to a rope so that anybody can ramp up to it. When we get deep into lifting, doing tons of squats and deadlifts, we'll develop adaptations to get better at doing these movements. A common one seen in many lifters, along with a lot of people in the general population, is spinal stiffness. But the spinal stiffness in these two groups happens for separate reasons. To get better at squatting 300, 400, or even 500 pounds, our spine stiffness will improve so it doesn't flex under heavy load. But with that adaptation, the spine gets worse at flexing, extending, laterally flexing, and rotating. And in the general population, spinal stiffness increases with age. But this is a byproduct of a lack of overall spinal movement, unlike the training adaptation that lifters receive. Without any activities that encourage spinal movement, the spine gets worse at moving. Enter the rope flow practice. It begins as a microdose that can slowly bring movement ability back to the spine, as it's a structure that is meant to move in various ways. It's also a great way to force yourself to get outside, get some sun, and get your feet in the grass. But you can definitely do this stuff just about anywhere. For myself, the skill of learning the flow with the rope has had a positive cascade of effects on my movement as a grappler, but my spinal movement has also become way more smooth. And as I improved, I began to increase the resistance by working with heavier ropes. This allows me to really zone in on shifting the weight of the rope with my spine because of the increased inertia that the heavier rope provides. The practice also becomes much more of a workout with the heavier rope, giving me a full body pump. After doing some rope flow, you're gonna be surprised at how good your back and your body feels. This keystone capacity keeps your spine young improving all aspects of spinal movement, which will decrease your probability of back issues, which most people deal with as they age. Keystone capacity three, calisthenics. Something that tends to be neglected is our body weight strength to weight ratio. Training with weights is amazing, and I hope all of you already have a strength training practice. Body weight training is extremely important because you can do this stuff literally anywhere, no gym needed. It also improves our functional strength. The skill of being able to maneuver your body weight is invaluable, which is why I wish I did gymnastics as a kid. And a goal of mine is to build up to stuff like this when I'm 60. All of these guys are over 60. And this guy right here is 72. A fall isn't something that he's worried about. But being able to do something like that starts with this. All of this equipment is easy to keep at home, at an office, or at an apartment, making it easily accessible and increasing the likelihood that you actually do it a few times a day. By slowly improving at my calisthenics capacity, using simple tools at home, dosing it throughout the day instead of one super hard and grueling workout session, I'm able to make it a habit, chip away at the skills, and slowly but surely develop the capacity to do harder, more impressive movements over time. This keystone capacity will massively improve your ability to exude functional strength with your body weight. You'll be increasing muscle mass, improving full body joint stability, and improving your body's ability to function as a whole. This will be invaluable as you age. By the way, if you wanted to pick up any jump ropes, ropes for rope flow, or calisthenics equipment from Base Blocks, I'll put all the discount links and codes in the description below. Keystone capacity four, floor sitting. Yeah, get on the floor and sit. Work, read, and move. The floor is an amazing tool and I started taking it more seriously after a conversation with the godfather of professional dunking, Kador Ziani. Kador, at 51 years old, can still dunk a basketball and he attributes his amazing movement ability in part to his use of the floor. The seventh posture is all about the floor. It's a floor life. When I say back to ancestral, back to the first way to communicate with your body is the floor. That's going to allow you to rebuild this Fascia, and fascia is, means connective tissue. The best equipment ever is the body and the floor. Some of his movement practice, which he dubs the seven postures, are an amazing set of movements that can be done when relaxing at home or working from your laptop. Daily, if I'm on my laptop, I make sure to touch these positions. He goes through these postures on the podcast that we did with him, but he goes even deeper in his Seven Postures book, which is on Amazon. I've included this microdose concept in Untapped, which is a program for martial artists and grapplers that's on the ATG app. I'd suggest trying to get into some of these positions, especially on the days you don't train. This is gonna allow your body to be even better at accessing these deep positions that you get into during martial arts, along with helping you get some passive mobility and recovery before your next session of training. 
This keystone capacity is an essential lifestyle addition that if developed when you're younger will make life much easier down the road. But you should still work on this even if you're older. I'm not saying that you can never use a chair or a couch, but many of us live in the chair and live in the couch. And the floor is something that's only touched if we trip or fall. Falling, by the way, is one of the leading causes of negative health outcomes, especially if you're older. One fall, along with low bone density, equals a fracture. Then quality of life slowly gets worse as many end up not being able to make a full recovery. But if you become accustomed to sitting on the floor, getting in some mobility and movement, putting your joints in some of these positions as you work, read, or relax, you'll naturally be giving your joints some much needed TLC. And just like the rope keeps your spine young, the floor, when used with purpose, keeps the body young. There's also been some groundbreaking research done on the importance of the floor. Enter the Brazilian sit to rise test. Scientists assessed over 2,000 people between the ages of 50 and 80 and monitored them over the next six years to keep track of their mortality rates. Those with lower scores on the sit to rise test had higher rates of mortality versus those with higher scores, meaning those that found it difficult to get down on the floor and get back up were statistically more likely to die sooner. Real quick, Take a look down below and see if you're subscribed. If you've been enjoying the content I've been putting out lately and want to see more, then consider subscribing. I also have a free Discord in the description where I answer all of your questions on training, nutrition, and recovery. So you can join over 500 martial artists that are making progress over there. Keystone Capacity 5, walking, running, and sprinting. This one takes the cake, but it's also the one where you need to be the most careful. You don't see many people sprinting in their 60s and 70s, but trust me, you can. It all starts with slowly progressing towards the ability of sprinting. If you're not walking often, then don't run. And if you haven't run in a long time, then don't suddenly sprint. If it's not already, make walking a habit. We're humans, and I believe that there's a certain amount of movement we need to get in each day that will absolutely benefit not only our physical, but our mental health. You can then start to do some run walks where you walk for a little bit and then increase your pace for a short amount of time, maybe 10 to 20 seconds, then go back into a walk, taking as much time as you need before the next run. Over time, you can increase that intensity just a bit and try some conservative sprints. This will take time and you need to be kind to your body as you build this capacity. Now, before you try this out, here are six keys to make sure you don't fuck yourself up with sprinting. Number one, make sure your body is adequately warm before your first sprint. Don't sprint with cold muscles. Your body should be loose and ready to move. So it's a good idea to build a little bit of a sweat before you take your first sprint. Number two, don't sprint at 100% ever, or at least for a very long time. Putting that much force through your body, especially being untrained, is a recipe for disaster. Just to ask Kevin Hart. Guys, I blew all my shit. Tore my lower abdomen, I, my abductors. I torn, I don't even know what that is, but I tore them. I can't walk. Number three, if your body isn't relaxed when sprinting, slow down. When most people increase their intensity, their body stiffens up and you can see the level of stress in their face. When running and sprinting, let go of excess tension in your body and only run at a speed where your body can maintain its looseness. This will keep you safe. Number four, find a hill. When you sprint upwards, it both decreases your stride length and lessens the load on your hamstring. This decreases the risk of hamstring strains, which happen to everybody when they start sprinting. Number five, like with every microdose, build up to this capacity over time. Don't rush sprinting. Aim to do some small mini sprints multiple times a week, making sure to walk every single day. Number six, remember that you can sprint in different ways. You can sprint with an assault bike or whatever piece of equipment you can produce a lot of force with. But the classic sprint is going to be the toughest version of a sprint, and you gotta be careful as you build up to it. 20 Basically. seconds, uh, why the 20 second sprint by that uh, amount? It's about without any warm up, what's at the, the edge of safe to do. Right. You know, it's the repeated attempts where you're gonna get injured. If I'm really tight, and, and doing it, then I'll, I'll run within my limits. But uh, there's some days are better than others, and I'm just like, you know, bam. <laughs> Young bodies can do that. Like all kids and all teenagers can just without any warm, just bam, take off. As you get past a certain age, you can't do that kind of stuff. Now this is something that Joel built up to, but when you regain the ability to sprint at 70 to 80% without it being a difficult task, you can begin to microdose daily sprints. The end goal is to make doing a sprint at 70 to 80% as easy as doing a push-up. When you've achieved that, you now have a skill that you'll be able to maintain for the rest of your life. This keystone capacity showcases your body's ultimate ability to produce force and power. A sprint is a violent act on an untrained body. 
which is why progressing up to a sprint should take time and patience. Research suggests that peak ground reaction force when sprinting can range from 2.5 to five times your body weight. So if someone weighs 150 pounds, they could experience peak forces ranging from 375 to 750 pounds or more during sprinting. And this is why with sprinting, you need to be conservative. It's one of the most violent acts you can put your body through. I hope the idea of microdosing totally changes the way you look at your physical health practices because this concept has absolutely changed my life. And there are definitely way more keystone capacities than the ones I mentioned in this video. And I wanna know what you think some of them are. So give me your thoughts below. Now, if you found this video helpful, check out this video right here. If you wanna learn how to build a strong and resilient neck, it's probably the most detailed neck video on YouTube. And then check this video out if you're a martial artist or any type of grappler and you wanna make sure you don't mess yourself up in your sport. This one's pretty awesome, so choose one.